Good evening and welcome to Monday Night Calculus. I'm Curtis Brown and I have Steve Kokoska and Tom Dick with me. Thanks guys again for being here. Uh, looking forward to quite a few optimization type problems this evening. Uh, it should be a really uh, good evening, maybe even an optimal evening if I can <laughs> have a pun or two in there. Uh, Hey, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a heads up as we uh, go into the last couple of these sessions for uh, the fall. So we've got this one this week, and then we've got uh, another Monday Night Calculus here in two weeks on the 12th. Uh, looking forward to wrapping things up then. Uh, if you are watching and you uh, finish watching this all the way through, uh, you can email me my email address. I'll put it in the chat here in just a second, Curtis at ti.com, and I'll send you a link for a uh, professional development hours certificate. Uh, also, um, I have posted the uh, teacher notes, the presentation that Steve's going to be going through this evening. I've already posted that in the description for uh, tonight's uh, session, so you can look down in the subscription or in the in the uh, description there you should be able to find the links to the teacher notes and to the student uh, documents if you haven't been doing that i highly encourage you go and and download those student documents for next week's or sorry two weeks from now session i'll put the link up there already today and uh, use those with your kids and then invite them to uh, one of these sessions to kind of check it out and get a little bit of instruction, maybe ask some questions. Uh, Steve and Tom are very approachable um, and uh, they would love to answer questions for uh, students as well as uh, teachers. So we really enjoy having them uh, join in. Steve, uh, I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much, Curtis. Pleasure to be here with you and Tom. I'm going to try to share my screen here and with a little bit of luck, I'm going to make that just a little bit bigger if I can. Curtis, and we want to go by width here. Hang on, I'm going to try one more thing if I can. Whoops. Oh, how do you like that? Ah, looks good. That's okay. Can you see that? I can see it Matt? just fine. I can see it just fine. Uh oh. Oh, what happened there? You still there? Yeah, we're still here. Okay, let's try that again. Well, let's try that again. Let's try this. Yeah, one. Well, you know, that's one of the things about doing these things live. Uh, it just, you know, that's that just happens uh, once in a while. How about that? Ah, there we go. Okay. All right, okay, good. let's give that a shot. Okay, thank you, Curtis, for your patience. So we're going to talk about some optimization problems this evening. And as usual, we've uh, given you the skills, enduring understanding, and learning objectives, and the essential knowledge statements from the AP Calculus CED that might help you prepare some lesson plans. And for tonight, a little bit of background, some ideas or concepts that you might need here. The first thing is methods for finding extreme values. And we've actually talked about a couple of those already on some Monday night calculus sessions. Uh, when I get to the first example, Curtis, I'm going to talk about three possibilities here. But I am going to be a little uh, loose here and leave some of the justifications open for teachers to work on. And I think one of the most difficult parts of these problems, of solving these problems, is translating word problems into mathematics, is the translation of key words and key phrases. And, you know, I'm often asked by teachers, well, you know, how do I, how do I make my students better at this? How do I get them better? And unfortunately, I think it may just be practice. You just have to do lots of problems. Tom, interrupt me whenever you want, whenever you've got some technology that you want to try. I'm going to start out with this. <clears throat> so how do you solve one of these optimization problems? How do you solve one of these word problems? The very first thing I think you need to do is to think about the problem and read it very carefully. Think about things like, well, what's the unknown? What's the unknown quantity or the variable? What are the given quantities? What do I know? What can I extract from the problem? What are the given conditions? Are there any extra conditions in the problem? 
I think number two is very important. You should try to draw a diagram if you can. I'm going to try to do a little bit of that this evening too, Curtis, to help me. This helps me visualize the problem a little bit better. When I have a diagram, I can identify the quantities that are given to me, those that I need to find. I can put them on the diagram, and that helps me a little bit better. And three, we want to introduce notation. I'm going to step aside here or as an aside, remind everyone that, you know, the College Board is really stressing notational fluency, good communication skills. And so I think it's important to use good notation. First thing you want to think about is to assign a symbol to a quantity that you want to maximize or minimize. Now, for the sake of just these instructions or steps, I'll call that Q for quantity. But use some other variables for some other unknown quantities or even known quantities and make sure that you label the diagram. So the next thing we've got to do, that's all the setup, I think. The next thing we've got to do is we've got to find some sort of expression here. We've got to find an expression for Q. Find an expression for Q in terms of some of the other variables from step three. Now, what may happen when we form this, write this expression for Q, it may be an expression in more than one variable. And so what we've got to do is to somehow get Q in terms of one variable. And so we've got to use the relationships that are given to us in the problem so that we can eliminate one of the variables, write one variable in terms of the other. So that eventually, if everything's working here, eventually we want to get an expression for Q in terms of just one variable, and I'll call it X. Wow, that's a lot to do just to get this function, and then I'm golden. Now I want to find the absolute maximum or minimum value of F using any one of the ideas, concepts that you've learned already. And one of the ideas that we've talked about is the candidates test. And we can use that if the domain of f is closed, it's a closed interval, and if f is a continuous function. So I'm going to try to illustrate the candidate's test here, although Tom may argue a little bit with me on this one, but, but let's see what happens. Here we go. So lots of examples tonight, Curtis. I hope you're on your toes here. I got a lot of questions for you. Oh, man, I'm going to have to lean on people in the chat tonight, huh? <laughs> So this question is about Farmer Mufi's goats. He has 3,600 feet of fence. Uh-oh. And he wants to fence off this rectangular field that borders a very long, straight, dense, thorny black bush. Bushes, bash your bushes. You know, I just learned recently this past summer that you can now get blackberry bushes that don't have thorns on them. What? How about that? Yes. Amazing which makes it, of course, much easier to pick. Easier for the deer to get at, but much easier to pick. Yeah, I suppose. So Farmer Mufi doesn't need any, any fence along those blackberry bushes. What are the dimensions of the field that has the largest area? Because, of course, he wants his goats to have as much area to roam in as possible. So I don't know how to attack this right off the bat. What I did is I drew a couple of pictures just to see if I could get a feel for what was going on. So I drew one over here on the left-hand side to start out with. So there's a fence that's 200 on two sides and 3,200 feet across the top there. There's another one on the right-hand side. That one kind of looks like it might have a little bit larger area. And that led me to this idea down towards the bottom of the page. Now I've got a diagram. I've introduced some variables. So the width of that field is going to be X and the length will be Y. Tom, I put sort of a leading question in there. Were you able to construct an interactive diagram or was that not possible? Whoops, you're gonna have to unmute, buddy. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was on mute. Uh, yeah, I wasn't able to quite get it to work as well as I'd like for this. So, uh, okay, but maybe another one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. 
So this is what I got out of this problem. I have the area of this rectangle, the area of this field for the goats is x times y. Very typical. I started out with this function that I want to maximize, but it's a function of two variables. I need to eliminate one of them. And the way to do that is by using the extra information that's given to me in this problem, which is I have 3,600 feet of fence. So what's the perimeter? What's the perimeter of this air of uh, this field minus the part along the blackberry bushes? Well, let's see, I have a length of fence there. I have a length of fence there. So that's my two X here. Yeah. I have a length of fence over here, y, there's my y, that's gotta be 3,600. Now, it doesn't really matter which of these variables I solve for, but it seemed easier to me in this case to solve for y in terms of x. So I did that over here and I substituted back into this equation for a, and I end up with one expression in one variable x. Now, I won't always do this in the remaining examples and problems, Curtis, but for this one, what I'm gonna say is the function I wanna maximize is right here and its domain is zero to 1800, inclusive, closed interval. Yeah. Now, some people would disagree with that and say, you know, it can't be a closed interval because you, know, you can't have a length of zero there. You can't have a length of 1800 because then you'd have no width going this way. <laughs> you have no width in this, like this way. Yeah. But you know, another argument is, well, you know, zero and 1800 is sort of these limiting cases. I can let X be zero. It's just that now I have a, a rectangle that has no width or I have a rectangle yeah. that has no height. So I can see both the arguments. I will tell you that this is the way that I learned it to do this, solve this sort of a problem with a closed interval. It certainly makes it, I think, a fuzz easier. But we'll see how we can justify this using some other methods if we took that as an open interval, okay? So bear with me on this. Well, I think I've done the hardest part. I take the derivative, 3,600 minus 4x, here's where I am. I solve that, I'll take that derivative, find the critical values. So I set it equal to zero, I get an x equal 900. There are no places where the first derivative does not exist. Since A is continuous on a closed interval, I'll use the candidates test. And the endpoints are really easy here. At zero and at 1800, the area of the region is zero. And at 900, the area is that. Boy, what is that? That's a little over a million square feet. That's pretty good for my goats. That's a lot of square footage. That's a lot of square feet, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So there's my maximum. Uh, the rectangular field with the largest areas has dimensions 900 by 1800, I believe. I solved that one or justified that one with the candidates test. But here are a couple of notes, and Curtis, I'm going to need a little help here. Okay. So another way that we might at least begin to justify this is with the second derivative test. So if I sneak back up here and take a look at the first derivative, where is it? Where is it? Here it is. And I take the derivative of that for the second derivative. I get a minus 4. So what does that tell me about the function or about the graph of that function A, Curtis? The second derivative is negative four. I'm looking for some help in the chat here because I'm not. Okay, what does that tell me that. about the graph of that function A? How's that gonna help me? Conclude? Maybe some of these students can help me out. Okay, well, how can I use that information to help me conclude that I have a maximum value? What can I do there? How does that, how is that helpful to me? What do you think? Any ideas? I'll give you a hint, Chris. Well, okay, so I just got the hint in the chat. Yes. I was trying to think about, uh, and I'm glad somebody mentioned it for me, that concavity is uh, related to the second derivative. Kind Very of good. The sign of the second derivative kind of indicates concavity. So that means that it's uh, concave down for that whole interval. Beautiful. So that I, at least I'm guaranteed to have 
something happened in that interval, right? That it, there is going to be a maximum somewhere in that space. Well, it doesn't, that particular statement doesn't say that, but it does say that it's concave down on our interval. It doesn't okay. say that function A is always concave down. Now, I think Tom helped me on this one, but I think there are actually, I've seen a couple of versions of the second derivative test, or maybe the second derivative test and a corollary. If we have a critical value, and we know that the second derivative is negative here, that means that we have a local maximum. That's the second derivative test. That's the way that I remember it. That's the way that I teach it. However, an extension of that is something like the following. If you have only one critical value in an interval, and the second derivative, let's say in this case is negative at that critical value, then we know that that must be the absolute maximum value. So there are a couple of versions, I think, of the second derivative test. I'm going to leave a little bit of this to the teachers and, and how they justify it. But here's another way, another method of justification, and that is by using the first derivative test. So this is a test that might be used if I said, well, OK, the domain over here for this problem is really an open interval. So then I couldn't, I could not use the candidates test. So I found my critical value, I only have one, and I can use this first derivative test. If the first derivative is positive for all values on one side, negative for all values on the other side, then I have an absolute maximum value of f. And similarly for an absolute minimum value. Now, I know that if Mark Corrali is listening, he's gonna correct me on this one, but I think on most of the absolute max and min values that we've seen, at least on the free response portion, they've always involved continuous functions on a closed interval. And so students can use, can use the candidates test. Students who elect to use the first derivative test are often not successful. They're often miss a little bit in trying to explain in using the first derivative test for justification. So all of that to say, I think there's at least three methods here. And if you're uncomfortable with using a closed interval, I think the best thing to do is to try to use the first derivative test. Tom, anything on technology here or can I go to the second one? Go ahead and go on to the next one, yeah. Okay, fantastic. All right, so this next example has to do with the least expensive container. Good problem as we box up all those Christmas presents to send Curtis via UPS. A rectangular storage container has an open top. And I'm gonna say that it has a volume of 20 cubic meters. Uh, the length of its base is twice the width and material costs $4 per square meter to the sides and three dot women. The base costs four dollars per square meter. Pardon me for the material, and the sides cost three dollars per square meter. I want to find the cost of the material for the least expensive container. So, what kind of container do I arrange here so that I have twenty cubic meters, but I want it to be the least expensive? Yikes! Hey, I drew a picture of this one. Here it is. So I have a base down here, and let's see if I did this correct. The length of the base is twice the width. So there's the width, there's the base. And there's the height. Boy, I got a couple of variables in here. Jeepers, I see a W and H, wow. Well, I know the volume here of this box. Let's see, that's L, W, H. And I know the volume is 20, that's given to me. So I know that's equal to, well, wait a minute, the length is 2w, okay, okay, that's good, I've got that. So I can write the volume of this box as 2w squared h, okay, let's see. I didn't even get to the part here where I've got a cost function, but I have a feeling I'm gonna have to use this relationship. 20 is equal to this 2w squared h. It looked easier to me to solve for H in terms of W. Now I'm looking at the cost function because that's what I wanna minimize. I want the least expensive container. So let's see, the cost of the base, 
four times, what's the area of the base? Well, it would be 2w times w. There's my 2w squared. Got that. Okay, I feel good about that one. Now let's see the area or the four sides. There's the cost, $3. And let's see, I have two sides that are 2w times h, and I have two sides that are just w times h. Wow. Put all of that together. Here's my cost function that I want to minimize. And as before, it's actually in terms of two variables, w and h. But ah, I'm ready to go. I can take this expression over here for h and plug it in. And here's my cost function with a little bit of simplification. All right, cool. This one, I'm gonna say that the domain is w greater than zero. I don't think I wanna fool around with a width of equal to zero. I'm gonna say that w has to be greater than zero here. Yeah, it wouldn't make sense to make it really, really big, but okay. Theoretically, w is greater than zero. What do we do next, Curtis? Here's my cost function. What do I have to do? I mean, it sounds like you might want to take a derivative. Beautiful. I got to take a derivative there. Excellent. Okay, good sense. Excellent. <laughs> so here we go. I take the derivative term by term. There's my 16w. Let's see, that's really 180 times w to the minus 1. So there's 180 minus 180 w to the minus 2. I'm going to do a little bit of simplification here or rewriting. I'm going to get a common denominator. And I did a little bit of factoring up there in the numerator to make things a little bit easier for me. Here we go. Well, let's see. I have to find the critical values. Yikes. I have to find the places where that derivative is zero. One of the places where that occurs is clearly the cube root of 45 over 4. Now, I know what you're going to ask, Curtis. I know what you're going to ask. You only found one, Steve, and this is a cubic, isn't it? It is. It so is. So what, what does that suggest? Well, a cubic would suggest that we've got more than one thing we might want to look at. <laughs> yes. And I suggest to you that there are no other values of W that make that zero. Why so is that, Steve? Why is that, Curtis? <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? What happened to the other two roots? Well, you said something about there being a limiting uh, part of the domain, perhaps. That might have helped had some. That is an excellent it. guess, but no. Oh, sorry. What do you think happened to those other two roots? It's a cubic polynomial. One of them's real, but the other yeah, two are. Are imaginary then. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's what's going on. So there are no places where the first derivative does you not give exist. give me a graph to look at. That's the problem. Uh, it's, uh, we're getting there. We're getting there. That's an excellent suggestion. And actually, maybe Tom would do that. I, you know, you know, if I'd have seen a graph, then I'd have known what I was looking at. That's actually one thing that I did, Curtis, is I actually took this 4w cubed minus 45 and I graphed it. Yeah, yeah. That's actually one thing that I did. That's a very good suggestion. Yeah. All right. There are no places. Don't forget the, the square. Two. Don't forget the squared underneath either, right? Well, yes, but uh, the place where that would be zero would be zero, but zero yeah. is not in my domain, so mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about that. And so the only critical value that I have here is this one, which is approximately two point two four one, and I'm going to claim here that for w in that range, zero up to that critical point, the first derivative is less than zero. And for w bigger than that, it's greater than zero. And it's really not that hard to argue that, Curtis, because if you look up here at the first derivative, that denominator is always positive. The four is always positive. Oh, yeah. And so the sign is completely determined by that cubic. And so, you can argue, I think, fairly straightforwardly that that's true. So what does that mean? I have a minimum cost when W is equal to that 2.241. And darn it, there's the cost, $120.50. That's pretty cool. Nice. Now, you asked for a graph. And so darn it, here is one. 
This is actually a graph of the function C. And it allows me to, okay, sorry, to see where that minimum value occurs at X or W, pardon me, equal to the cube root of 45 over four. Um, if I were doing this on a calculator, I might zoom in a little bit more because it is a little tricky, a little difficult to see that the minimum value is there, but indeed it does occur at that value of W. Beautiful, Tom, anything here? Or should I go on? Well, Steve, believe uh -oh. it or not, I got <laughs> the interactive diagram to work for your first example. Oh, all right, let's see it. Okay. <laughs> we want to take a look at that. Please all right, I'm gonna stop sharing. All there right. There you go. Okay. So I will try to share my screen and see if I can do this uh, successfully. And you all can- uh, Hey, how about uh, that? If you're seeing something that's- uh, Yeah, that's looks cool. Here. Okay. Uh, so um, this is definitely not something uh, you know, would expect a student to do necessarily unless they're really interested in it. But as a teacher, putting together an interactive diagram like this can be, uh, I think, really instructive. And so this is one I just prepared for this particular uh, example. Um, what I did was uh, got your blackberry bushes here and we've got the fencing on three sides. Yep. And uh, the fence, what I did was just add up the fencing length. So it'd be two times uh, the 600 here and okay. uh, the 2400, so there's 3600. And I think that was the constraint. We had to keep that. Right. Uh, and I also calculated the area enclosed. In there. So, so what's neat about this is on uh, uh, using Inspire here, so Inspire lets you take a calculation like this and actually lock it. Uh, so you can actually freeze it. So it really does make it a constraint. So exactly. I can uh, grab this corner of the rectangle. And if I move it, I can only move it to places that'll keep that fencing fixed at 3,600 uh, in length. Okay. Uh, now this was, I think was one of the pictures you had happened to be a 600 by 2,400 rectangle okay. and here's the area of that rectangle uh, so let me grab this point here and move oops excuse me let me try it again well maybe oh there we yeah, go. There go so now i've got a new rectangle uh, but this length is less than what I, excuse me, this area is less than what I have. Notice the fencing length is, is exactly the same as it was before, but the right. area is different. So what I could do is move that point. Well, excuse me, this is like I'm double selecting or something. So let me try that again. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. It moved there for once, didn't it? There we go. Uh, oh, that's cool. Now here, I think I got a bigger area. Yeah. And let's see, can I get it bigger? Oh yeah, this is nice. Now you actually had a solution where, let's see, I think it was- um, 162, I think. 162 for the, Oh, okay. So I'm really, really close to that. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That oh, is wow. I think I got really close. And I'm just curious, what is the dimension? What are the dimensions of the rectangle that yielded that maximum area? And sure enough, it looks like it's when the width yep. is half of the length there. So that's kind of just by uh, 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 experimenting, trying to see what those things were. At least we get a feel for empirically kind of what where the maximum area is uh but then with the calculus we we get it precisely and i think that's the moral is the calculus gives us those analytic tools to find that exact sweet spot for finding that maximum area okay. that's cool all right well, i'm going to go ahead and stop the share and okay all right over to you okay thank you tom all right, here we go. Let's try another one. I like this one. 
So this is kind of a typical question you'd find in AP calculus books. It's not very uh, app applied sort of a problem. But let's see if we can find the coordinates of the point on the graph of y equal to cosine of x. It's closest to the point 3, 1. So I'm going to start with a diagram. So I've got a graph in here of y equal to cosine. That's in blue. Here's my point 3, 1. And I've drawn a line segment from the point 3, 1 to an arbitrary point on the graph of cosine of x. And that point I'll call x cosine x. And what I need to do is to take a look at the length of that line segment right there and make that length as small as possible. Okay, so what's the distance between these two points, this point and the point three, one? Well, using the distance formula from your geometry class, the square root of x minus three squared plus cosine of x minus one squared. And theoretically, oh wait, one good thing, that's in terms of only one variable x. I like that. One bad thing is it's kind of a complicated expression. It's got a square root in it. And I'm looking ahead. I really don't want to take the derivative of that. And so rather than minimize that function d, we'll minimize its square, which I'll just call s of x. Why is that OK? Well, if you minimize the square, you've certainly minimized that square root. No question. And this function s is maybe just a little bit easier to work with. Now, I didn't write anything down here, Curtis, but what do you suppose the domain for x is? The domain for x? For s. What's oh, the domain s. for this function? Like for x? What are you talking about, Steve? You say it is a function s that I want to minimize. What's the domain here? I don't see any limitation on it. Uh, I don't either. Very so good. I'm going to say that, uh, you know, it really could be any, any value. Could be all reals, couldn't mm -hmm. it? Yep, could be all reals. So let's see what happens here. Well, this is going to turn out to be certainly a technology actor problem. I'm going to take the derivative here, term by term, and I've got to use the chain rule. Two times x minus three to the first power times the derivative of what's inside, which is just one. Two times to pardon me, two times cosine of x minus one to the first power, derivative of the inner function this time is minus the sine of x. Now, I don't think I can solve that one analytically. So I went to technology to try to find places where the first derivative is equal to zero. Now, I'm going to leave a little bit here for you to justify. I'm going to show you a little graphically, and Curtis, stay with me. I got a question for you here. All right. So I did this, and I found three places where that derivative was equal to zero, and there they are numerically. So I, I dug out my TI Inspire or my TI-84, and I found three values of x where that derivative is zero. Now, I claim that the value of x that produces the minimum distance is 1.803. And that's actually about where I drew this one, right about there. So I believe that that value of x produces the minimum distance from the point 3, 1, <laughs> excuse me, to the graph of the cosine of x. OK. Now, I'm going to address some of these other values here in just one second, okay? Let's take a look at the graph of S and see if we can figure out what's going on at these other two values. I'm sorry, Curtis, I'll arrow down just a little bit more. There's the graph of this function S. There's the point 1.803 on there. Remember, this is the graph of S. So it sure looks like I have found the right value of X that produces this absolute minimum value. But what's going on at these other two places here, these other two X values that are critical points? 
Can mean, you sort of reconcile that with this graph down below? Sure. I mean, I I mean, I can see it, it looks like approximately 3.2. There's a relative maximum there, right? So I, I seem to see a uh, very good. And what's relative, going on over here? And then a relative min at the other. Uh, Beautiful. Location. That's what I think is happening too, Curtis. Very good. Now I'm going to come back up here and I'm going to try to reconcile, put all of this together here. So where is that value 3.2 on the graph? Well, that's about down there. I'm going to draw this line in here. That's about there. So that's pretty clearly, I think, not an absolute minimum value. The other one is 4.2. That's about right here. Well, that's close. It almost looks like the same distance. And if you take a peek down here, well, that's pretty darn close, isn't it? Huh? Yeah. I look at the Y values. Now, I got one other thing here to reconcile to figure all this out. You know, it just doesn't seem like I've found the right answer when I look at that graph. When I look at that graph, it seems to me that, you know, it's a shorter distance right there. So why yeah. is that? Why does it look like that's true? But it isn't. But that graph seems to suggest not only does it look like there's a minimum over here, but it also looks like this distance is about the same as the one that I drew in over there. Why is that? No, it's a slow. Why do you think that's true? Subtle. Tom knows. <laughs> Tom, you're going to, or sorry, Steve, you're going to have to ask that question again. Just okay. say it, so, say it, say what you mean here. <laughs> wise guy. All right. So on my graph, okay, on my oh, graph. Oh, you know what? I see what? it. What? You uh, didn't use a square. Beautiful. I did square not use ten. an aspect. This is one of those spots where we can't trust our eyes, right? Beautiful. You Beautiful. Know? Yeah. So this is one that if you drew on your calculator without using a zoom square, which I which I don't do by automatically, you might say, geez, I got this value at one point, but it doesn't look right at all. It looks like on my calculator screen that there's another value, maybe even closer to one, well, at least less than 1.57, where the value with the distance would be smaller. Very good, Curtis. That's excellent. Very good. Okay. Tom, anything there? Uh, as a matter of fact, I do. Oh, <laughs> all right. Here we go. All, all yours, right. buddy. Okay. And let's see, are you seeing uh, my screen all right here? Yeah. Got it. Okay, so um, this is a square scaling. So the aspect ratio here does match up. And when we say square, we mean that one unit in the uh, x, x direction is exactly the same length as one unit in the y direction. Uh, and what I did here was just graph cosine x like you had, but I put a point okay. on that graph uh, that I can move around. Okay. But it stays on the graph. And I've also got that point three one. So I okay. think what we probably want to do is uh, draw a line segment. Let's see. Between our point on the graph to that point three one. Okay. And then I think we want to measure how long it is. Okay. Sounds so good. Let's just, let's just do that. Let's see, measure the length and the segment. And hmm. Okay. Very let's cool. Let me put that uh, I'm gonna put that link um, let me put that down here where we can see it. And just for a reality check, let me move my point back over to the Y uh, intercept on my graph, because that's a... Uh...
Now that maximum no, that's, you saw, that's really the maximum on the cosine curve. If you saw the the max, but zero one, the the length over to three one, the distance should be three units. Ah, yep. that, that makes sense. Yep. Uh, so again, this is one where I mean the calculus is giving us the analytic tools to do this, but at least we could empirically see if we could find a minimum distance by just moving and see how small can we make that distance. I've got it down to, oh, getting down and below two. Oh, I'm still getting smaller. Oh, 1.73. That looks good. One, a little bit below that. Oh, oh. Not even really. Uh oh, it looks like there's a transition here. It looks like I got down to 1.716, close to that. But then it starts going up again. <laughs> And it gets well, above two, but then it starts decreasing again. Now, can I get it to as small as 1.71, whatever it was? And it looks like, no, nah, I can't quite do it. I get close, but it looks like that sweet spot was somewhere over here. Yep. Now, I'm doing this just totally by eyeballing it. But then with your analytic solution, we can see how good a job, how close did we come just empirically? Uh, to that. And uh, let me see, let's take a look. You found the point was at 1.803. Yep, I'm at 1.815. So I was within about a hundredth of the... That's pretty good, isn't it? Uh, uh, but it is, it's great to do a reality check on this. And this was an interactive diagram that was actually quite easy to make because you can throw up a graph, put a point on it, Put a point by the coordinates three one and uh, make that line segment. So it's it's uh, kind of a cool application here that uh, we can use to check things out. All right, I want to stop my share and turn it back to you, Steve. All righty, thank you. That's cool, Tom. All right, let's take a look at example four here. Another problem where we want to maximize area. So we have a rectangle with sides parallel to the coordinate axes, and it's inscribed in a region that's bounded by two graphs, two parabolas, one opening up and one opening down, and we want to find the maximum possible area of such a rectangle. All right, well, let's see here. I'm going to draw a diagram first. So I've got this parabola that opens down. That's in blue, if you can see my colors, Curtis. Yeah. I've got a parabola opening up. That's 2x squared minus 9. And I want to inscribe a rectangle in there with sides that are parallel to the axes. So I'm going to have a side here like this and one like this. Okay, so let's see. What's the length of that? Well, I, I left out one maybe annotation in this graph. But this point right here, if you can see, Curtis, between the one and two on my graph, that's going to be my arbitrary point that I'll call x. So that the length of my rectangle is really this distance x plus this distance x. So it's really 2x. And what's the height of my rectangle? Well, let's see. This is kind of like going back to uh, what I think of as uh, an integral problem where I want to find the area between two curves. I think of y high minus y low. So let's see. At this point x... The high curve is 18 minus x squared. The low curve is 2x minus 9. So I did that subtraction and ended up with 27 minus 3x squared. So, okay. What's the area of this rectangle? Well, it's the length times the height. And I did a little bit of simplification. Not too bad. I've got an equation for area in one unknown x. Let me step back for just a second here and maybe think a little bit about what the domain would be. Curtis, I hesitate to ask, but what do you think the domain would be here? For, uh, let's see. For the function be, A? Well, it's gotta be greater than zero. Gotta be greater than zero. And is there a, a maximum here that we go? Or could it be, could it go on forever and ever? Well, it's not going to go on forever and ever, but I don't have a good sense of what the maximum area is going to be. Okay, I'm going to give you a hint. 
Yeah, I was looking at the in at the uh at the intersections there, but I don't know. I mean, I guess I can use oh you got three. Okay, great. <laughs> uh huh. Indeed, those two graphs do intersect at x equal three. And so the and far negative three. Right, right. <laughs> and so the farthest I could go is up to but not including three. Let's let's do it that way. So I didn't write anything down here. But I would say that my values for x could be within the open interval, 0 to 3. All right, so I need to take the first derivative of a. There it is. I'm going to factor it completely. And although it might not look like it, I do have the difference of two squares there. I've got two places where the first derivative is 0, but I'm going to cross one out because that's not really in my domain. I understand there's an awful lot of symmetry here. We only need to worry about that x equal to square root of three. There are no places where the first derivative does not exist. And let's see, I'm gonna take a look at the second derivative here for a little variety. There it is. And <clears throat> when I evaluate the second derivative at the square root of three, it is negative. So that says I have one critical value in the domain, 0 to 3, open. The graph is concave down at that point, And therefore, I have a place where the maximum area occurs at x equal to square root of 3. I think I plug that into this expression for a. And the maximum area turns out to be, I believe, Exact analytically, 36 times the square root of three. Cool problem. Tom, okay with that one? I mean, that, that is a cool problem. And I could definitely see another one of those uh, kind of interactive things that Tom, you know, you could build. Absolutely. And, and Absolutely. That. Yep. Um, that's a really nice problem. Okay. Well, that takes care of the examples, Curtis. I'm going to take a look at a couple of the problems that we assigned for homework. I hope I wasn't the... supposed to work those. Yes, you were. <laughs> 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 so we have we have this cylindrical can, and it has a closed top, and it's to be constructed so that the volume is 16 pi cubic inches. I want to, find, want to find the height of the can that will minimize the amount of tin required to construct the can. Very sort of real world kind of a problem. You can kind of think of a, a soda can or, or a can that's going to hold some other food or, 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 or some other material. I want to minimize the amount of tin required. If I do that, that might minimize my cost of, of building this, of manufacturing this can. So, all right, as usual, what I tried to do is to draw a diagram. Here's my can over here on the left-hand side. And let's see, it's got a radius R, let's suppose, and a height H. See, I've got to find the height of the can. It's going to minimize the amount of tin required. I think in doing all of that, I will, of course, find the radius, but here we go. What's the volume of this? Well, it said it was going to be 16 pi, and I know the volume of a right circular cylinder is pi r squared h. And let's see, I canceled out the pi a little bit, so now I have a relationship between r and h. Okay, for whatever reason, I decided to solve for r this time. And I have an expression for r because I know eventually I'm going to have to get an equation in one unknown. So let's see, what's the surface area? Because that's the amount of tin that I'm using. I think what I wanna do is focus on this expression first. Pi r squared is the area of that circle at the bottom and the circle at the top. I've got two of them. So that's the area of the tin at the top and the bottom. And where did this come from? Where'd that other expression come from? Well, I didn't draw this, but if you can picture this, Curtis, I'm gonna cut that cylindrical, that cylinder straight up and right. lay it flat. And its dimensions are 
H for height and around the circle, which is the circumference of the circle, mm -hmm. which is two pi r. So there's an expression for A, it's got two variables, R and H. So we're not ready to take any derivatives yet. I'm gonna use this expression for R and substitute in over here. Here we go, I did that and I did a little bit of simplification. I've got an expression in terms of H. Oh, this is a neat problem. All right, I'm ready to take a derivative. Here we go, Curtis. Eight pi is constant. I'm gonna think of that H, square root of H is H to the one half. So there's one half H to the minus one half. There's the 32 pi, derivative minus one H to the minus two, yikes. And just a little bit of simplification. Now, what do I do? Well, I've got to find places where that first derivative is equal to zero or does not exist. Well, I'm not worried about the h equals zero. That's not in my domain, although I didn't stop to say anything about the domain, but we're not going to have a height, a can that's height zero. Theoretically, h could go on and on forever and ever. So this is another one of those problems where the theoretical domain is h greater than zero. So let's see, I'm gonna to try to solve this expression. H a prime of h is equal to zero. So let's see. I set it equal to zero. Now I set those two quantities equal. Let's see, I think I can get rid of the pies, cancel the pies. I did a little cross multiplying and I've got this expression see what happened next. I guess I divided both sides by the square root of H and son of a gun, I've got an H equal to four. Boy, that worked out pretty nicely. So I did a little bit of arguing here. My domain is H greater than zero. I have one critical value and my justification for this producing the minimum amount of 10 is gonna be with the first derivative test. So I went back and did a little bit of thinking, whoops, a little bit of thinking about this expression right here. And is it positive or negative when H, pardon me, when H is less than four or when H is greater than four? And in fact, H equal to four does indeed produce the surface area that's minimum. That's a neat problem. All right, we've got two more problems in here that we assigned for homework. Curtis, I'm gonna skip to number three. We've only got a few minutes left. I like three because this is a nice problem for students. We can always go for a pizza afterwards. So this is a good one. Yeah, you are make me hungry. All right, here we go. Let's consider one slice of a round pizza. It's a sector of a circle. That makes sense. Let's suppose the slice must have a perimeter of 32 inches. So this pizza is being consumed by a math major and they want a slice that has exactly a perimeter of 32 inches. Now this sounds like kind of an odd question, but what's the diameter of the pizza, pizza that will produce the largest slice in area? Hmm, I need a picture. Hmm. So here's my pizza on the left-hand side. Sorry, Curtis, I didn't put any pepperonis on there or anything. But here's the slice. And I am originally thinking about that perimeter. How do I characterize, how do I write that perimeter? Well, let's see. Let's see here. This distance is a radius of the pizza or the circle. This distance is r, the radius of the circle. So there's my two r. And the remaining perimeter of this slice is that arc. And that arc, remember from your geometry days, has length r times theta. Wow. And I want that perimeter to be equal to exactly 32. Now, I didn't get to an expression for the area yet, but you know we're gonna have to use this constraint. So what I did 
is I solve this expression for theta in terms of r. Looks kind of funny, but I think we'll be able to use this. Now let's take a look at an expression for the area of that slice. All right, Curtis, where does that come from? How do I know that that's the area of my slice of pizza? Can you explain that to me conceptually? Why is that true? So, well, pi r squared is the area of a circle, right? That's Good. the total Excellent. area of your pizza. Yep. And uh, theta over 2 pi is how much of the circle you've got, right? Two Beautiful. Pi it is the radius. proportion of that. Proportion of that total mm -hmm. circle. Excellent. Proportional. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. All right. I did a little bit of simplification. There's my expression for area. Ah, but wait. It's got two variables in it. So I'm going to substitute for theta. Here's my expression in R, a little bit of simplification. And son of a gun, after all that work, this reduces to a pretty easy expression for area in one variable R. Beautiful. So here we go. I take the first derivative, pretty easy term by term, 16 minus 2R. I set that equal to zero, and r is equal to eight. Now, I really didn't think much about the domain here. Maybe we could go back and think about that. Certainly r has got to be greater than zero. It'd be pretty hard to have an infinitely big pizza. But for this one, I thought a little bit about what r could be here at the endpoints, and I think it's zero and 16 because Let's see, if r was equal to zero up here, I'd get an area of zero. And if r was equal to 16, I'd also get an area of zero. You might think about what's happening with my slice if that happens, if either one of those happens. So if, I, if you'll allow me to solve this one with the candidates test, there are three values that I tested. And in fact, the radius of the pizza that gives me the largest slice with that fixed perimeter is eight, and the area is 64, 64 square inches. That's pretty cool. That's a neat problem. Well, I think that's pretty good, Curtis. Uh, we'll post all of the answers. Tom, any last uh, technology tidbit here? Well, not technology, but just an observation on this last problem that's kind of curious and would be kind of worth exploring is um, I, looking at the perimeter of your slice is 32. Yes. And if R equal eight is going to give me the maximum area, it's kind of curious to me that that means the curved, the straight line distances are the two R's. Mm -hmm. That's 16. The curve piece has to be 16, too. Isn't that something? And I wonder if that's true in general. And in other words, if you replace the 32 by some other number, will the slice have to be such that the curve part is exactly equal to the diameter, which would be the two R's? Yep. That'd be kind of neat to check out. Very cool. Very. I, cool. I'm going to conjecture that it is, but I'd have to check it out. Use calculus. Very cool. That is a cool conjecture. Uh, interesting questions, uh, Tom, for sure. Well, thank you, Curtis. Yeah, Very this good. Was, this was a good uh, good session tonight, Steve. I really enjoyed uh, really enjoyed the the problems and. Uh, Interesting. You were on top of your game tonight, Curtis. I don't know. Well, I don't know if I was totally on top of my game. And there is a question: generalization to non-circles uh, as well. Is that? Uh, I wonder. That might be another interesting. Uh, to non-circles. What do you mean? Like a square pizza from De Lorenzo's in Trenton? Is that what they're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> is that, well, is or that the different? elliptical? We have an. Uh, we have a place here in in Dallas area that serves elliptical pizzas. Elliptical pieces. Wow. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Right. They're uh, ellipse elliptical. 
Um, so I think there could be some interesting uh, explorations there uh, okay. to go and play. Um, there is an interesting comment here. It says, uh, Michelle t said that she uh, tries to reinforce uh, graphs uh, my students know, so you could use that to look at the graph of 16 minus R squared, 16 R minus R squared as a transformation of the parent function X squared. Um, so it would have the zeros at uh, zero and 16 and be able to kind of work at it from there. That's a, that's a good uh, point because then symmetric at, at eight. Um, yeah, that would be a- Very a, good, very yeah. good. Nice, Michelle. That's a that's a really good uh, really good tip there. Uh, well, thank you very much, guys. Thanks to all the students in and Miss Connolly's class. I know there were several students on this evening. Glad good. you guys uh, logged in and checked it out. Uh, go ahead and um, look forward to seeing you guys here in a couple of weeks. Uh, again, if you watch this all the way through, you can email me at curtis at ti.com. I'll send you a uh, PD certificate um, and love to, to hear from you. Uh, also, just any feedback and thoughts that you have uh, around the sessions, if there's other things we want to have uh, in, this, uh, in these sessions or things you guys would like to have in, uh, incorporated feel free to let us know uh, about those things. Mark Crawley's does say uh, AB uh, times pi for ellipses. So that could make another interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll let you guys Very go. Uh, look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Very good.